Religion, clean and undefiled before God and the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their tribulation, and to keep one's self unspotted from this world. Where it's taken from our epistle today, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Does St. James here mean that we ought to only to have the care of widows and orphans, not for the poor, the sick, or the imprisoned, or anyone else in need? Does he not rather gather together all of the poor and disadvantaged under this one title, that this group, widows and orphans, being in the most tribulation, represents everyone else in tribulation, everyone else in need of pity? Widows and orphans are those who have lost their husbands and fathers. Does this not accurately describe our world today, our society? A society sorely lacking in husbands and fathers. You know, someone coming into this might say, well, what happened to them? Was there a great war? Did an enemy attack us and say, we must put to death the husbands and fathers, lest these people rise up against us? An enemy did indeed attack us and did indeed target husbands and fathers for elimination. That enemy is feminism. In the late 19th century, the daughter of feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Harriet Stanton Blanche, said that matriarchy would be the best system for human improvement to be carried to the high point of perfection. Since its very inception in the 1800s, feminism has sought the downfall of patriarchy. It has sought to eliminate specifically masculine vocations. There's no more masculine vocation than that of husband and father. It is obvious that all feminists, even those who would not label themselves as such, consider the elimination of husbands and fathers as patriarchs as having a vocation to govern women and children in homes. They consider this a victory. They consider this good. Isaiah chapter 5, Woe to you that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Feminism has fought this battle in two ways. It has tried to masculinize women so that they are better able to compete in a man's world by promoting specifically masculine virtues and jobs and styles of dress to women from infancy, surrounding us with these fictionalized ideals in movies and every TV show, grocery store, and everything else you can lay your eyes on. It has held up work outside the house as real work, denigrating passivity, denigrating submission, denigrating the hidden but immensely necessary work of women in the family and in society. The second way has been an open attack on masculinity. For the only way to level the playing field of a man's world, as they would qualify it, is to feminize men, to shame them into suppressing their masculinity so that women can achieve. Evidence is all around us, but consider what a prominent Catholic, Republican, counselor to the president said in an interview with the New Yorker. I've been in a very male-dominated business for decades, she says. I tell people all the time, don't be fooled because I am a man by day. We must get over the myth that feminism was ever good, that there was ever a good age of feminism, that it was ever going anywhere but exactly here, the world we live in now. 
Feminism was the first to propose that women should be men and men should be women. We are simply watching the evil fruit come to full ripeness. Feminism, since its beginning, since its beginning, has pitted wife against husband, put women into competition with men, and left no one raising the children but the TV, the internet, and the liberal government. Feminism is a bad tree. It has always been a bad tree, and it's bearing bad fruit, the only kind it can produce. What has feminism done for you? It has not made women happier. It has not made children happier. It has not made women's lives more fulfilling, families more peaceful, relations between husbands and wives any better. Like the Marxism which helped create it, it offers nothing but empty promises. It has produced not one good fruit. What then has it produced? A society of widows and orphans. It has held up the independent woman as the ideal. Sure, she can have a husband, she can have a family so long as her career comes first, so long as she isn't submissive to her husband. And when men are feminized, they shrink from their natural duties. They check out and go play video games. They revert back to being teenagers, fatherless children themselves. They stand helplessly by while their wife takes the reins. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Even if the feminized man is around, he is no longer husband, no longer father, no longer patriarch, no longer ruler and king of his wife and children. And so you have a society of widows and orphans. Feminism has given us death in place of life, sterility in place of fecundity, strife between spouses instead of harmony, disobedience in place of obedience, chaos instead of order, pride and selfishness instead of humility and charity and sacrifice. No, Father, let's not read that verse about being women, wives being submissive to their husbands. Let's just sort of cut that one out of the Bible. Also, that one about the head coverings. Sound familiar? Oh, surely, surely you will not die if you eat that fruit, if you take liberties with God's commands. Surely, those were culturally conditioned commands. Surely, they no longer apply to you. Yes, yes, I know he said not to eat of it, but that was then and this is now. And you're so much more independent and free. You've evolved. What then is the solution? We must first reject the evil. We must keep ourselves unspotted from this world. We must purge ourselves and our families from all signs, all trappings, all attitudes of feminism. We must examine our lives. Have we let ourselves be influenced by those billboards that show women soldiers? The TV shows, the movies, do we revere and not revile those high-profile women who boast that they are a man by day? After rejecting the evil, we must choose the good. We must recognize true feminine virtue. We must support and encourage feminine attire, feminine behavior. We must value men for their masculinity and women for their femininity. We must do this individually in our families, in our churches, in our society. I highly recommend this book, The Nature, Dignity, and Mission of Woman by Father Carl Stalin. As you see, it is very thin, very easy to read. It's insightful and clear. There is a copy in the back. Please don't take it if you want to take a picture of it and order it from wherever. In it, he shows very well that the distinct vocation of women in no way trivializes or devalues them. For instance, he observes that the parable of the mustard seed profoundly expresses the working of man, which grows in externally visible making, building, and organizing. While it is the yeast, the parable that Christ tells right after he speaks of the mustard seed, which suggests a woman just as important for life, but that works invisibly, 
in a hidden unknown way, yet permeates the dough and changes it so that it has the quality that gives it meaning and purpose. Like yeast, he says, the woman permeates everything with her care and her love. She serves God and souls usually in a hidden, unknown, discreet way. Finally, let us turn our Blessed Mother Mary, or rather, let us consider the choice that stands before us, the choice of Eve or Mary, which is the ideal of femininity. For we know which is the feminist ideal. Eve rises up against patriarchal authority. She gives in to the devil's temptations. The devil sells her on class conflict that she is an oppressed class who needs to rise up against her oppressors. She disobeys her husband. She makes decisions for both of them. She takes the lead and tells him to follow. She decides what's good for her, not God, not her husband. She is in one sense the weak link, easily blinded by the devil's lies about what power can be hers if she reaches out and takes the forbidden fruit. But she is, though, in another sense, the most important foe of the devil. Perhaps the devil knew that he could not make Adam sin if he came at him directly. But he knew that closest to Adam's heart was Eve. Eve had access to Adam in a way the devil did not. So he brings down Adam by bringing down Eve. When you attack a city, you don't try to go through the city's walls. You get someone on the inside to open up the gate. Someone with a privileged position and a lot of power. How different is Mary? How different is our true ideal of feminine virtue? Instead of holding up the independent woman or a successful career woman who balances, never does, work and family is the ideal. Instead of that feminism of Eve, let us love the femininity of Mary. We, we see her femininity not in the virtues themselves, for we ought all to have humility, charity, hope, obedience, and so forth, but in the particular way that she lived those virtues. Consider that she follows Joseph, nine months pregnant, to Bethlehem. Not an easy task. She follows him again into a foreign land, into Egypt. Does God tell Mary to go to Egypt? No. He tells Joseph, and Joseph tells Mary, and Mary obeys Joseph. Femininity is not weakness. What strength does Mary have in obedience, in that obedience to her husband lived out day after day, working with her own hands as they live in hiding in Egypt, supporting Joseph and encouraging him in his vocation? Remember, there is no greater creature than Mary. She was Joseph's moral superior. But God, who willed to raise her above all creatures, also placed her in obedience to her, to her husband, to one of those creatures. Consider a comparison with St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist accuses the sinner of his sins. He makes straight the path of Christ. He comes in from the desert, a bold man pointing up to God. Mary's soul, however, her great soul, pure, dedicated, a sealed fountain and enclosed garden. Her soul magnifies the Lord. She too points to Christ, but in a very different way. She is able to give counsel from her great wealth of obedience. Do whatever he tells you. John points to Christ, but Mary bears him secretly in her body, forever in her heart, if John the Baptist is a mustard seed, Mary is the yeast. For who was at the heart of the church after our Lord ascended? Who is the mother of the church, the conduit through which all grace flows? None but our blessed mother, Mary. The devil preaches false freedom and dis through disorder. 
So if you wish to be truly free, choose God's order, choose the femininity of Mary. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.